So this uh, movement um, <coughs> that sets in for some people, this movement of seeking what we might call self-discovery, um, if looking at it a certain way. Um, this movement from the perspective of this teaching really is about something very practical. What I mean by that is it's not about understanding something for the sake of understanding. It isn't about coming to know yourself truly just for the sake of knowing yourself. Um, someone might say, if I were to ask, what is the point of your seeking? And they say, well, you know, I don't know myself. And if uh, the seeking is fruitful, I'm, I'm told that I'll come to know myself truly. And so that seems like a worthwhile reason in and of itself. But what will that deliver? So if you don't know yourself, and then seeking is to know yourself, what does it deliver in practical terms? If you just come to know yourself differently, Who's to say that the new self is any better than how you knew yourself previously? So I wouldn't frame it in terms of just a concept uh, that talks about uh, seeking for something that's not practical. But rather, I would frame it in terms of what do you get what will you have after you know yourself that you didn't have before, other than knowing yourself? Because what's the good of knowing yourself? What does it deliver? So in this teaching, it sort of flips the seeking around and emphasizes the very practical outcome, the very pra practical change. Essentially, the teaching says that liberation or enlightenment is really about happiness for the human being in this life. And if we left it at that, the explanation itself is not really very clear, not really very practical in terms of an explanation, because it leaves a word like happiness in there that is likely to be heavily misunderstood because the truth is that everyone is already seeking happiness. It's just that they are seeking a happiness which is not the happiness that is available in a continuous and unbroken manner. So the teaching goes on to elaborate and say what we're really looking for and what's available in this search is continuous unbroken happiness for the human being in this life, but that happiness essentially is happiness through peace of mind. Which really means we're looking for peace of mind in daily living. Whether we realize it or not, and the truth of the matter is that the majority of humanity doesn't realize that that is what um, will really satisfy doesn't realize that what we will get after liberation is peace of mind. And because this isn't known, humanity is seeking for pleasure, pleasure, pleasure. So humanity is seeking happiness, but in the form of pleasure, pleasure, pleasure. In the form of essentially life turning out the way that they would like it to turn out. And life's not going to turn out the way we imagine it because we're not in control of life. Life is like <clears throat> this immense, moving, morphing energy that in the next moment can deliver anything 
within a fairly wide range of possibilities. And our imagination, our wish for life to look a certain way is pointless. Because life doesn't turn out according to our expectation, our hope. And to the extent that we firstly see that life is independent of my control, and secondly to see that if I hold an expectation about how life will look in the future, I'm essentially disconnecting from the present moment and creating a self-image within that expectation about who I am and what I need life to look like according to my belief of who I am. So if we give this some thought, if we really contemplate what is being put forward here, we'll start to realize that so many of our psychological and intellectual movements make no sense. Does it make any sense to have an expectation, to have an image of how life needs to look according to your sense of self, and then hope that life in its immense capacity to change, that's all that life is, hope that it will meet your expectation. Doesn't it make much more sense to drop the expectation, allow life to unfold knowing that it always has and always will, and it will unfold one way, and that one way is not in your control, so doesn't it make sense to replace your expectation of life with, in a sense, a wish that life turns out the way it turns out? Which really means to not have a wish. To, If we understand what I'm looking for is a oneness, a non-resistance with life. then it might click. And this is what insight is. When it clicks, in a moment, we've been doing something for our whole life and a click hasn't ever happened in relation to certain things until the insight happens. And the insight is the click. If we realize that we're looking for non-resistance with life, oneness with life, flow with life, which is peace of mind with life, meaning that when life unfolds one way in each moment, we're not in opposition with that. Now, for that to be the case, a lot of our mental relationships or ideas about life need to change because as they currently stand, we find ourselves in opposition with life. And so all it takes is a click for us to realize as long as I have an expectation of how life needs to unfold, whenever life unfolds differently, I'm likely to, especially if life unfolds differently in a way less favorable to me, then I'm likely to be in resistance to life. if I have a benchmark that I'm holding up to life in each moment, every time the benchmark doesn't match, the mismatch is the resistance I have, the attitudinal resistance I have towards life. Just because of the contrast between l life itself and my benchmark that I'm holding up and comparing life to my benchmark, which is my expectation. So if we understand I'm looking for non-resistance with life, harmony with life, peace of mind with life, the only way I can have that is if my benchmark dissolves. If I have no benchmark, 
then life will unfold and it won't be fighting against an idea, an expectation of how life should look. So there's a lovely saying, I don't know where it came from, and it says, happiness is not getting what you want, but rather happiness is wanting what you get. And the wanting what you get is not an active intellectual idea, oh, I want this. Like so much of um, the understanding, the knowing, the wisdom in life, when it really sets in, the understanding is a negation, an absence of. So wanting what you get really means just the absence of not wanting what you get. And the wanting that we are talking about here is an attitudinal um, fight. I don't want that. That attitudinal fight that stretches horizontally in time, sometimes over years. I don't want that. I didn't want that. That shouldn't have happened. And it's a dissolving of that and the absence of that fight is what is referred to as wanting what you get. So do you want a broken leg? Because at some point you may well find yourself with a broken leg. Now you don't want it ahead of time. It wouldn't make sense to wish for something painful. But in the same way, it doesn't make sense to wish for something pleasurable either. Because if it's not delivered, we're going to be in resistance to the pain that's delivered. So what is being suggested here is that happiness is not getting what you want, but rather the falling away of an idea of what I want, an idea of what I need, understanding that life will only ever turn out one way, that the outcomes in each moment will be one way. And that one way is, not, is, is a result of everything that came before, including our very complex makeup and the circumstance we find ourselves in, the actions that we perform in that moment, the decisions that are made, are all a result of everything that came before. And the decisions that get made, which are not really my decisions, but rather decisions happening through this very complex body-mind organism, will result in an outcome. And that outcome is not in anyone's control. But it will turn out exactly as it has been set in train to turn out. So if we can come to see that life is not unfolding because in the moment I make a unique decision that could have been anything, that unique decision is a result of all of the unique happenings that came before it. So wanting what you get is the falling away of the expectation ahead of time. Understanding that life can deliver you anything compared to what you imagine. And in fact, it will only ever deliver one thing. What we could say is predetermined, your destiny. Now, we can't know what life is destined to deliver. We don't know what our destiny is. We know what our destiny is at the moment it manifests, at the moment it actualizes.
one of the great Greek philosophers, Heraclitus, um, one of his core concepts was to expect the unexpected. This is what the human intellect does very poorly. Life is one big unexpected unfolding. And instead, the human intellect expects, expects what it wants, what will make it feel good. So Heraclitus is telling us the right attitude, the right understanding about life is to expect the unexpected, to know that life can deliver anything. And if one has the attitude of expecting the unexpected, which really says, I don't know what's coming next. Then if that's your attitude, your attitude is much more aligned with the nature of life. Now, if you can't see life clearly, if you can't see life as it is, and if we are one with life, then it makes sense that we don't know ourselves truly. If we can make a mistake of thinking that we are in control of life, thinking that life can give us something that we wish for and hope for and try to make happen, then we're underestimating the very nature, the very movement, the very power and force um, behind what is happening. So what I'm talking about is coming to see life truly. Life is a big unfolding of sometimes pleasure and sometimes pain. That is the flow of life. Sometimes pleasure and sometimes pain. And what will unfold is the exact pleasures and pains that you are destined to receive at exactly the time that you are destined to receive them. And no human being can know how much pleasure or how much pain they are destined to receive. So another of Heraclitus' um, concepts or sayings is you can't step in the same river twice. And he's pointing at the changing nature of life on a micro level. Moment after moment, the nature of life is change. This too shall pass. Life is impermanent. Change is the only constant. As soon as you take your foot out of the river and put it back into the river, it is a different river. So you can't put your foot, in, your foot into the same river twice. It's always changing. And even while your foot is in the river, it's changing. And we don't know how it's changed. It's too complex. We don't know what is making it change but we know it's changed. But we may not look at it as changed. And if our intellect just sort of looks at the river and says, oh yeah, that's, you know, the river. And it's always the river. That means we're not really looking at it in enough detail to understand that life is always change. Change beyond our control. Now, you can't just want or make yourself
not have resistance to the way life turns out. I mean, sure, it sounds great, be, being one with life, not resisting life, because we understand it's only ever going to turn out one way. But it's not going to happen just because we want it to happen. There needs to be a deeper understanding of why the resistance to life happens. The expectation, the benchmark that we have is a result of something deeper. It's a consequence. It's a consequence of a deeply ingrained idea of who we are, a self-image. And that self-image is convinced that in order for it to be complete, it requires life to deliver it more than it has. It is comp convinced, it feels, the self-image that has been set in place feels inadequate, feels incomplete, it feels uncomfortable. Its nature is uncomfortableness because it's a thought-based sense of self that by its nature is never going to feel at rest and at peace and one with life. The comfortableness, the oneness with life happens when that thought-based identity subsides. And we all have experience of this from time to time. If you're an artist and you find yourself engaged in your art, you can find yourself so focused, so one-pointed in your attention that the thinking mind collapses. There's no space for the thinking mind when the body the body mind enters into certain activities that it gets completely absorbed in the activity and at that point the psychological identity with its expectations and with its sense of self collapse and dissolve and so in certain meditations and in deep sleep the sense of self is absent now in deep sleep um, it's absent because the whole of the manifestation is absent. Daily life is absent. So with the absence of daily life, the person dissolves, not just the thinking mind, but the whole experience of life. So when you are engaged in your art, that's not entirely the same as deep sleep for when the um, the painting is happening or the dancing is happening or the writing is happening the body mind is still there but there is a oneness with the activity the separation of a me doer doing the activity has dissolved into the activity itself and there is then just writing writing happening, no writer doing the writing. There is a writer in the sense that the body is there writing, but no psychological me, I am a writer, doing this of my own free will and volition, and I hope that the outcome is going to be better than anything I've done before, and I hope that it wins me prizes and awards and praise from the other for my great skill. That psychological me has dissolved. And so the sense is that there is no writer, there is just writing happening, just dancing happening, no dance and dancer. In deep sleep, there's not even dancing happening. But there definitely is no psychological me that is there to create the resistance and the uncomfortableness with life and this, that psychological identity is not there to create 
or to feel its own uncomfortableness. So the expectation is set up because this psychological identity is in place and the psychological identity has this idea that it requires outcomes, pleasure, love of the other essentially, to be complete. And we all have these experiences from time to time where that's not there, where the psychological identity collapses. And in those moments, the uncomfortableness with oneself, the resistance to life, the expectation in the future, the regret in the past, falls away. And what we have, whether we recognize it or not in that moment, because it can be very ordinary and simple. I'm not necessarily talking about a peak experience where the psychological me dissolves and we know life and know ourself in some extreme profound way where there is bliss or an overriding sense of peace. You might be doing the gardening, be fully absorbed in the gardening and the thinking mind, the psychological me that is so obsessed with itself and with whether life is supporting its um, its fullness or not, just subsides. And for that half an hour or that three hours, the thinking mind is not there. Now, the person may not even recognize that the thinking mind has stopped. They would if the thinking mind is um, always very present. Because in that moment, the suffering, the uncomfortableness will have gone. But sometimes it can fade away and there isn't even a conscious uh, recognition of it because it's so ordinary and simple. It's just the absence of the suffering. And as we start to recognize that very simple absence of the suffering, and as that happens more and more regularly and we see, oh, it's just the cutting off of a certain type of thinking about who I am and what I need. A cutting off that in this case um, was aided by a full absorption into, into the job that you were doing. The, th the cutting off can happen in more active ways than that. When the intellect, the working mind, the functional part of our thinking starts being equipped with these concepts, with descriptions and pointers that are pointing at what it is that actually creates our uncomfortableness, creates the sense that leads us to seek, either seeking spiritually or seeking for happiness and pleasure. So for the average person in life who hasn't been driven to or hasn't had the seeking movement start, they're still out there seeking pleasure, aiming to get more primarily because there's an inherent uncomfortableness. So until we start getting descriptions that tell us what the uncomfortableness is, we'll continue to believe the conclusions that we've come to and the conclusion that we've come to is oh there is this uncomfortableness because i don't have what i need and it seems like it's very obvious well of course i need more money or i need a partner i don't have a partner i need um, to find a good group of friends that i can um, catch up with regularly and and be entertained so i'm not bored and lonely um, and so these reasons seem like they are the reasons for our uncomfortableness. But rather, the uncomfortableness is there and then we start looking out and thinking that it's because of something out there that is missing. And so then the quest is to get what 
we've concluded is missing. Which is why when you get that from time to time, it doesn't satisfy because it's not actually the cause of the uncomfortableness. The uncomfortableness isn't there because you don't have a partner, because your friends, um, you don't have friends to entertain you, because you don't have enough money. The uncomfortableness is there because of a disconnection from the essence of the human being, an essence that has been covered up by the existence of this psychological identity that life has put in place. Life has designed us, life has created us. We are all seven to eight billion human beings are all part of life, like um, individual pieces of a jigsaw puzzle or components of a, a car. We all make up life along with all of the animals and plants and inanimate objects, all of the physical laws. The totality of life has exploded into existence and nothing exists out outside of life. So we are a product, we are, have been extruded out of life from ashes to, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. We come out of the five elements and we will return to the five elements. And this entity that believes it is an autonomous, separate entity is actually not at all autonomous or separate, but rather one with life as is everyone else. And so life has put in place this psychological identity that suffers, that feels uncomfortable. And it is life that undoes it. Life tells us, hey, there is an aspect of the human being that sets up expectations. And it sets up expectations because there is an false idea of what it is and what it needs. Life tells us this. Life has put in place that identity, that psychological entity, that belief system. We didn't do it. The human being is a product of life and the human being either has the deeply ingrained belief of personal doership and attachment to outcomes embedded in it, that is the natural progression of the development of the human being. Life has put that in place. And then at some point life comes along and says, hey, do you know you're not seeking for um, outcomes really? I mean, you might be in, in your movement. You might think that that is what will give you happiness and so you are seeking it. But at some point it says what you're really seeking whether you realize it or not, which really means what you eventually will turn your focus onto hmm, is not pleasure but peace of mind. And peace of mind is just the absence of suffering. And the absence of suffering comes with the absence of certain beliefs, deeply ingrained beliefs. So yesterday um, I emphasized the importance of a stopping of all thinking and an allowing of awareness to function on its own, which it always does, allowing awareness to register the present moment that is always here. So if I raise my hand, what is aware of my hand is the awareness. So everyone who is conscious of the daily life experience, which in this case conscious means 
is aware of the table and the chair and the other people, meaning sim the simple fact that the senses are operating means that awareness is functioning. So consciousness or awareness doesn't mean that someone is awake in a spiritual sense and is aware of their consciousness. Um, for someone to be conscious or aware in its most simple form means just the functioning of awareness through the body, which means they are able to see and hear things, to be aware of the environment that they're in. And if you're driving a car, you have to be aware of the other cars. You might not be paying exclusive attention to what you're doing. Um, there might be thinking, but there is also awareness of the um, external world and awareness of the thoughts. If you um, can feel, can sense the thought um, and can put your attention on the thought, it is because awareness is there. So awareness registers. So yesterday, the emphasis was stop thinking. And the, the stop thinking wasn't an instruction to a doer to do the stopping of thinking, because if that was the case, the doer would say, okay, I need to stop thinking. So what shall I, I'll, I'll tell myself to stop thinking. Because the doer only knows how to do thinking, to approach problems by action. And action, by and large, is thinking about how to do something, um, or when it doesn't, when the body doesn't know, um, and you give the doer the job of stopping thinking, which it's never done before. The doer is always thinking, not stopping thinking. Then the doer says, okay, well, I need to figure out how to stop thinking. And so it will think and try through thinking to stop thinking. And if in a particular moment there is an insight that says this is never going to lead to the stopping of thinking because the doer is the very thinking that ideally will stop. And that insight in that moment might lead to stop, like a freeze, don't move. The doer might realize um, with the aid of the working mind actually, the working mind might realize, oh, it's about stop. Just drop what you're holding. We've, we've been, the, the thinking mind has been told grip. It's, uh, I'll use an analogy. It's like if someone in life uh, was born and grew up and all they were ever told is to grip. And grip means hold tight. And they're told, whatever you do, grip and hold tight. And that's all they ever practiced was gripping. And then someone came along and said, okay, don't grip. And they only know how to grip. It's like, you tell them, no, don't grip. And they grip tighter because that's the training. Um, whatever they're doing is going to be gripping. And in, an in, in a moment, there might be this recognition that we can't do not gripping. It's just a stop of what the thinking mind is only capable of thinking. It's not capable of stop doing the stopping thinking. But if it just freezes, in that moment, that can be the stop and the shift outside of thinking.
Now, a lot of people might think that's a much more profound um, teaching, thinking that that's what it's all about. And it has its place. But sometimes in order for things to undo themselves, a set of descriptions need to be given to equip the working mind. The working mind is not the same as the thinking mind. The working mind, as long as it doesn't get hijacked by the thinking mind dynamic, is very functional and doesn't include attachment to outcomes, doesn't include the sense that I am the doer doing this. So the working mind gets given information that says you are not a doer, you are the functioning of a machine that has been equipped to function a certain way. And the working mind can actually understand that at a certain point. The working mind will see thinking, especially functional thinking, and the psychological thinking, for that matter, the expectation. It'll see it as the happening, the functioning of a biological instrument that is designed to function that way. And so when the working mind is given concepts, a concept that says the human being, because of the psychological identity that is part of the human being put in place by life, is continually setting up expectations about what is needed in life in order for it to be complete, in order for it to be happy, in order for life to be okay. The working mind gets given that information and then when the expectations um, fire into action, which is often when the outcome is not in line with the expectation, the working mind can actually see it. It goes, there, there is the uncomfortableness in the moment. Because there was an expectation that um, the person that was going to buy my car who said they would turn up at 10 o'clock and pay for the car, sends a message through and says, sorry, I'm not buying the car. And then this resistance happens because we don't get what we wanted. A sense of uncomfortableness with the outcome, which is based on our attachment to outcomes, thinking that that outcome was somehow going to make us more complete. A blame will happen because of seeing the other as the doer and seeing that they, of their own free will and volition, have chosen not to come when they said they were going to come and chosen not to buy the car when they had said they were going to buy the car. And so... There is the uncomfortableness of attachment to outcome. Like feeling, no, this can't be happening. This is not how life is meant to be in this moment. So an attitude of getting what we want and in that moment not getting what we want. And then blaming the other as if they are the doer, seeing them as a separate independent entity who has chosen and could have chosen differently, chosen to deliver pain to me. And then we say, you hurt me, you delivered pain to me, I hate you. And all of that is contained in the narrative about how, you know, they could have called um, three hours before because you've been waiting for them and you didn't do the other things you needed to do. There's a narrative about 
what is going to happen now that you haven't sold your car because for the last three weeks they had assured you that they were going to buy the car. There is a narrative about how you would never do this. How could they do this? And within that narrative is your sense of self, the false sense of self. So the working mind can get given these descriptions and can then start to investigate, can start to see the movements that have been described. And I can assure you that without these descriptions, you might have an awakening. There might be a shift outside of thinking. But without the descriptions that allow the dynamics to be understood in very practical terms, what is likely to happen is that there are going to be a whole lot of ideas about what liberation is that have probably nothing to do with practical daily living for the human being. The blame, the shame, the expectations will continue to be there more or less because the deeply ingrained beliefs haven't been looked at. We may find ourselves, if we're lucky, being able to drop out of um, feeling like we are a human and find some peace there. But what it is, in a sense at some point, is a bypassing being human. So liberation or peace of mind is eventually about having an integrated understanding that allows us to say, I am this incarnation, I am this person, and a person is the combination of the impersonal consciousness of source linked to a particular body-mind organism and functioning through that body-mind organism as personal consciousness. Personal consciousness is the experience that is happening within the consciousness functioning through the body. So the experience you know as your daily life experience from the perspective of this body as opposed to the perspective of the family pet or your neighbor. That is your personal consciousness experience that is happening because the consciousness of source is functioning through this particular body-mind organism. And liberation is not knowing yourself separate from the body. It's not knowing yourself as not the person. But rather it's about coming to a realization at some point in your seeking when you have quite possibly um, approached the seeking from a very non-practical point of view, maybe having had certain awakening experience that says, this is all a dream, or at least like a dream, in that it is um, a very complex momentary experience arising in consciousness and yet what we have to realize is until the body dies we are destined to continue to live in the dream we can't escape the dream the best that is possible is to find that the inaccurate relationships, the inac inaccurate attitudes towards life fall away, which comes from understanding life more intimately than we did before. So as part of the human development, we have lost contact with the part, the aspect of the human being that lies outside of thinking because the psychological identity has developed and life is essentially experienced through that lens, through that set of beliefs. And so life is continually bumping up against this psychological identity. And from that perspective, life is seen to be a particular way and when that psychological identity falls away 
we see life differently. That doesn't change, that doesn't mean that we're no longer in the experience of life. So if we've been seeing life, if we come to see life as a dream, it always has been a dream. It ha always has been the experience of life. And seeing it as that doesn't suddenly take us outside of the dream. What it means at some point is that we have to realize, oh, I have to continue living this dream until it's destined for the body to die. Living this dream as the individual, doing in each moment exactly what I'm destined to do, depending on the circumstance I find myself in, which really is dependent and part of our life circumstance. I have to continue having interhuman relationships. I have to continue being part of the flow of life, which is sometimes pleasure and sometimes pain. Enjoying the pleasures fully when we come back in and integrate into living the dream fully as the human being. And we have to endure the pains of life, understanding that the amount of pleasure and pain we experience in life is exactly as destined. So we can't escape the dream. We can't escape life. Realizing it's a dream isn't um, a magic portal out, out of the dream. What can then happen is that our misperception about life that was there previously, our misperception about ourself can fall away, which means we get to connect to the part of the human being that was um, obscured because of this psychological identity that was essentially seeing life so differently. And that part of the human being is independent of thought, If in a meditation you find yourself not thinking, you find the thinking mind stopping, so there is no concern about the past or the future. There is a presence with what is in that moment. And in a meditation, uh, very often if it's a closed eye meditation, there is the the sense of sight has fallen away and so when you are very present with what is without bringing in a residual self-image of yourself without bringing in memories of who you are and, and you are just present with the experience there is a sense that i exist but that i in i exist is not a psychological or a mental I. It is a direct sense of I, impersonal I, no age, no gender, no preferences. And yet the I is undeniable. Its existence, isness, amness. We drop the I sometimes because when we talk about I, we are so um, identified and only know I as the psychological identity identification with a body form that it sometimes needs to be dropped and said the I is the illusion the I is the error the I is not real and so by using that we are essentially saying, trying to, the teachings are trying to point us into a place prior to thinking about yourself as this or that, a body with preferences and age. And in a meditation that might happen where the narrative quietens down and at the same time, in a particular moment, awareness becomes aware sometimes for the first time of the present moment exactly as it is and in that there is presence and a grounding into that presence delivers an undeniable sense of existence so if the question was asked are you dead 
to the space that you would that you are in that moment the intuitive answer is no i'm not dead i am but the i is not the i of a individual that is the essence of the human being that has been forgotten and overlooked So we know ourselves only on the surface, so shallow do we know ourselves. We know ourselves as the physical that exists in the realm of the flow of life. And so when we know ourselves as the physical, the best we can do is to seek more pleasure and less pain. This is why when we only know ourselves as the physical and the accompanying feelings and emotions and psychological, um, when we only know ourselves on that shallow level, it is for that reason that we are seeking happiness through getting what we want. Because on the physical level, better is pleasure. And worse is pain. So if we were just physical entities, then what we would be seeking is pleasure, pleasure, pleasure. That would be more, that would be better in life. The amazing thing is that we are multidimensional um, life forms that have many layers that make up the whole. The physical is very much part of who we are. But it is like, a, like the clothing. It's the outer skin. And it's there and it delivers a very important part of the life experience, which is the sensory, the flow of life, part of the experience the core of the human being is not physical it's at the depth so it's like moving if we if you like science it's like moving from the mechanical into the quantum they coexist to find the quantum to start to understand the quantumness of manifestation and understand that it is radically different in nature to the mechanical structure of, of life, doesn't mean that, oh, now I know something more true and I can discard the mechanical. They coexist. There's a, a, a tragedy in a sense that happens when we are directed inwards at the expense of another aspect of what we are. Because we end up maybe realizing this aspect, the inner aspect, but may well deny the relevance or the existence of the outer aspect, which means we haven't come to know ourselves truly. We have come to know a part of ourselves that f we had forgotten. And in the process, we are now denying a part of ourselves that we actually are. So the integrating of the realization of that inner aspect that had previously um, been overlooked, the integrating is integrating that realization of consciousness or awareness into the human experience and knowing ourselves as the body-mind organism through which consciousness is functioning which really means knowing ourselves as a singular life form of which the core is consciousness. Consciousness outside of the, in a way, un, and on another level, another layer, another dimension to the flow of life. 
This is the reason that the human being can be happy in life, regardless of the circumstance that we find ourselves in. Happy on a continuous, unbroken basis. Because that core consciousness doesn't change. It doesn't grow old. It doesn't get sick. And it doesn't require love from the other. It doesn't require the external environment to cooperate in a particular way. So the movement has to be inward to connect to the core of the human being. And that movement inward essentially happens in an integrated way together with the dissolving or the weakening of the psychological identity that essentially is um, a belief that what I am has nothing to do with a core that is already complete and at peace. So, any ideas that we have about how life should be are of the psychological identity, the false self. So, to the extent you see yourself getting passionate about defending those ideas, recognize that that is a reinforcing of the false sense of self. If you have a concept about something, allow it to be there in a way that you know to be a concept, an idea, an opinion that is likely to change in time, an opinion that may be accurate or inaccurate and may be therefore useful or not so useful at bringing about certain worldly objectives. Know it as a concept that will have its opposite concept. God exists is a concept. And every concept has its opposite concept. God does not exist. God exists or doesn't exist independent of either of those concepts. Know your concept to be a description of something that doesn't bring that which it describes into existence or out of existence. Which means if a neighbor or a friend has a different concept to you, understand that that concept is not actually affecting that which it is describing. It may be describing something accurately or inaccurately, and it doesn't matter. If one has transcended one's own concepts, meaning if one has seen that they are not truth, that they are a description, an opinion, a view about something, and that something is far too complex for us to have any real idea about it. We can have an idea about it from a very particular perspective, meaning we can have a relative idea about it, and our relative idea about it might be useful in relation to a relative objective. But to mistake our concept about anything in life as something absolute is to lose yourself in the concept. If you can let go of your concepts when you get um, involved in them 
and realize I don't know. And if the uncomfortableness is coming up because you are identified with the concept about something, that's when the most ideal time for the I don't know that that is truth to come up. And that can help us drop into this deeper part of ourself that is outside of thinking. So even your idea about being a mother or a father, your idea about being a member of society, your idea about what is right and what is wrong, your idea about how politics should deal with situations. If we can only recognize how complex economics is, how complex medicine is and science is, how complex all of these things are and how they all interrelate into each other. And if we can realize how much of a non-expert we are, And how thinking that we're an expert creates all these opinions about you know, how we would make life. If we realize, I don't know, I'm not an expert. And anyone who has become somewhat of an expert, because when I say an expert, it doesn't, an expert doesn't know everything. <laughs> an expert knows something much better than someone else but they don't really know it. But if you've become an expert in something, you'll realize how when you're not an expert, you have no idea. And humans in general, in relation to most things, have no idea and they think they're experts about how they should parent, about how children should be, about how their neighbors should be, about how their brothers and sisters should be, how their father and mother should have been, without realizing even that that is our uncomfortableness. So if we realize it, stop and come back out of the passionate idea of what we know. We don't know how life should be or how life shouldn't be. Surrender. Surrender your thinking, especially when the thinking is the suffering that keeps us disconnected from ourself, keeps us disconnected from what is available, peace of mind, which is the end of suffering. So to the extent that one becomes aware of the different thought forms, the different thought themes that create suffering, the job is to stop. And the working mind requires information that makes it see the sense in stopping. I don't know. I don't understand how the universe should be in this moment. I don't understand where it's going. And that's not um, a failing. That's a reminder because of the suffering that might be registered, 
to drop out of thinking into the core of the human being. Everyone thinks according to their genes and up-to-date conditioning. So when thinking is happening, it's not your doing, it's a happening. And so this thought that arises and says, actually, my thinking doesn't serve um, many purposes if it is the thinking of the thinking mind. And so let me just allow my thinking to go um, uninterfered with when it is the working mind thinking, when it isn't delivering um, uncomfortableness. And whenever it is delivering uncomfortableness, let me at least see that that thinking is flawed. It's based on a false idea of what's important. It's based on a false idea of who I am. It's based on a forgetting of my core and knowing myself only on the physical level. And a recognizing of that means there is motivation for the thinking to be left mid-sentence. Just stop. I don't even need to think the rest of the topic through. If I was having an idea about how the politicians should run the world, and I see that it's been going for 10 minutes and it's creating a sense of resistance to the way life is, in a particular moment we can just say stop and we don't need to finish the, um, the thought. And in the moment we stop, it's like, ah, here I am. So if um, there are any questions, I'll open it up to questions. We, we have some people here already. Let's see. Can you hear me, Sharon? Yeah, so not all pain is um, psychological. If, um, you know, I came and put your finger in a vice and squeezed it, then the pain there is biological and it has nothing to do with your thinking about the pain. It is going to be there based on the biological structure of the body. Um, and if the pain is there, you're not thinking about it, 
isn't going to um, change the pain, but it means that the pain isn't going to be intensified by an extra load of um, resistance to the pain, psychological resistance that says, why is this happening? This isn't fair. Why does it happen to me? Um, you know, I haven't done anything. Um, so the psychological resistance to the pain in the moment adds a whole layer of um, intensity on top of the physical or the, the biological pain. Um, now, the second part of the question is, is that pain in the body that is being felt, is that emanating from deeply ingrained, um, repressed shame and hatred, essentially? Um, and it's very clear from the accounts of many people, and I've seen it um, in my own seeking process, um, that when psychologically repressed energy is released, um, it can create physical pain. And uh, if, you know, you can have intense pain that feels like a broken bone and after the releasing um, and feeling into a deeply repressed anger for example um, and acknowledging it and and some insight around it the pain that felt like it was a broken bone can instantly vanish um, so there's no doubt that there is a correlation or that there's little doubt based on what I've observed that there is a correlation um, between some physical pains in the body and repressed um, energies that at their core have to do with doership and attachment to outcomes that happened in the past that were locked away and what has been locked away is essentially the false sense of self in that repressed energy and it seems to refer into physical pain. Uh, now, the point is that if someone is experiencing pain of that nature, the energies are locked away in the subconscious, in the unconscious. Um, and if they're going to be seen, they'll be seen at exactly the time they're destined to be seen. And it's not your doing that um, gets them to be seen. It is a result of a whole lot of things coinciding, which might mean, you know, listening to a description that at some point um, allows something that is in the unconscious to, um, you know, to be seen or to be felt. Uh, but that's going to happen exactly as it's destined to happen. Um, it's based on a whole lot of factors outside of your control. So for as long as the pain is there, whether it comes from repressed energies or whether it is simply a biological occurrence due to nerve damage, for example, or um, you know some other mineral deficiency or imbalance in the body that is purely biological regardless of whether it's biological or stemming from a deeply ingrained psychological thing your attitude to it is this is a happening in the moment it is part of the flow of life it's pain and the amount of pleasure and pain that i experience in each moment is my destiny unfolding? Um, now that attitude means that the pain is being looked at objectively. It means that it's not going to get rid of the pain, but it is going to mean that your involvement in it, your attitude to it is an attitude of non-doership. And that is what this teaching says um, 
or that's what this teaching is really um, talking about. It's not talking about becoming a perfect human being in your personality. It's not talking about controlling how much pleasure or pain you have in life. It's talking about the attitude that lo adds a whole load of uncomfortableness in the form of guilt and blame and pride and expectation and worry on top of the physical pain. Now, a doctor, for example, uh, um, you know, traditional medicine doctor or a science-based um, doctor, they'll have a teaching, essentially, or a science that is not focused on the attitude, is not focused on the uncomfortableness or the suffering, but on the physical ailments. Um, and so they may be able to help with the physical side of things. Now, I know a lot of um, uh, things like fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue are things that doctors haven't had that much success in um, dealing with, especially not across all cases. Um, but my point is that there are people that are specifically looking at getting rid of pain. Um, this teaching is talking about your attitude that adds a very big load of uncomfortableness on top of the pain if it's the attitude of attachment and doership. Um, Sharon, it seems like you're muted, um, so I can't hear you. Oh, I don't know how, how that happened. I don't know how that happened. I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, what I want to say is that the, the, the sperm and the egg meet, and, and your genes and up-to-date conditioning actually make it so that, um, you know, that, that your story unfolds that way. And, you know, but however it unfolded for me, there was always a lot of them you know, stories that this by that, you know, abuse and, and a lot of different um, guilt, whatever you want to think, was, was really pushed from the very beginning of my life. And what I'm trying to do, I guess, is to understand, you know, why I feel better when I actually journal <laughs> about the hate I feel, you know, because, you know, there's got to be something in this mind that, that still has, you know, um, well, you know, I guess because I'm a, I was a poor student, I don't know that I followed any more that much, but, you know, there's a lot of belief that there's a lot of terror in the mind, but I had a lot of terror. See, that, that came through my whole life. My husband tried, my ex-husband tried to kill me, my mother blamed me for polio. These are all these stories that were collected. My child turned to drugs, anything that would give me a, an idea that was out there was in here, in the self, just projecting out my story. So, I mean, do you think that, you know, that biology of belief has any kind of, like, that, I mean, I know your teaching is about you're not that anyway. You're the self, really. You're not the doer. Cause, but I, want it, I, I guess what I want is, and I think that I'm not allowing it, I'm, I'm, I'm forcing it a little bit, I want this, this, um, Mind to follow away like yours did. <laughs> and it hasn't yet. <laughs> yeah, well, you see, that that's that's an expectation and an attachment to outcome in itself that is going to create more suffering. Um, it's understandable um, because we hear that it falling away will deliver an optimal life and or an optimized life experience, i.e. The absence of suffering um, but even that description has has to be taken as a description and not something that is saying this is what you can do um, so it's a description that says 
And a lot of teachings won't give that description because they know it will be turned into an objective that the doer is going to try and achieve and an objective that um, an expectation will be around. And so then if the suffering exists, the doer will resist the suffering saying, you know, this isn't peace of mind. I want peace of mind. I've heard it's available. How am I going to make it happen? When's it going to happen? And the teaching is saying, it'll happen if it's destined to happen. And if it isn't destined to happen, it's not going to happen. Um, so essentially, the doer that has an expectation eventually has to surrender and realize, well, it might be my destiny to never have peace of mind. So the, the, um, the working mind, if the working mind really hears what's being said, has to come to this conclusion and say, oh, my destiny w may well be to have pain for the rest of my life and to never have peace of mind on top of the fact that there is pain. That's, that is the working mind hearing the teaching, right? Yeah, that would be the, the, you know, the, the course, the right mind, which is the, they call it the Holy Spirit, the working mind, the mind, the right mind, the mind that, that, that is not filled with the thinking mind in the stories, the mind that is just, just clarity, like just acceptance. But, you know, I'm going to tell you that um, there is a tenacious desire to, um, to be rid of, I mean, I take medicine. I'm not crazy. I, I know how to do that because I know a lot of spiritual people that think that they can heal themselves and they suffer. I don't want to do that. In fact, in one of the things on Facebook, I saw a guy writing, you might be in the room, that awareness has shifted into... You know, a lot of, uh, I don't know if you wrote terror, and I was like, oh, no, <laughs> I don't want terror, because I don't really have the terror. I have, you know, but I, what I have is, like, a lot of judgment, a lot of, you know, and I have to keep listening, and I'm not the doer until the doer just gets quiet, because, um, you know, there is a thing out there that says that belief does cause us problems, that we don't need medicine. I didn't follow that. I still took medicine. I, I was still wise enough to know what I needed. But, you know, the thing is, you know, if I have to live with this pain, I can manage it through exercise, through meditation. And if I am to wake up, but what this doctor was saying is if you take medicine, you're blocking the story of you releasing this hatred. And I, and I, and I don't know. It's not true the way you're saying that. Um, well... There's, look, I'm not saying that, um, you see, that, that's, this is where, in a way, um, therapy um, is more focused on being able to guide someone to dive into um, what is possibly um, suppressed and hidden. So spiritual teachings often just give, um, in this case, a framework, a general framework, and um, other teachings will just say, no, just rest um, as you truly are. Now, the body might not be ready to, um, to do that because there could be, you know, these energies that you're talking about, they could be in the system with such intensity that there just is no space for um, some of the things that, are being spoken about, like the non-doership, if, if the suffering is really intense, if the pain is really intense, the witnessing may not, um, they, it simply may not be able to happen. And therefore, there are lots of um, other modalities that can be used in conjunction with the seeking that can be very beneficial. Um, so, I'm not at all suggesting that there isn't a link between the heavily suppressed traumas in the body and pain. I think that's um, probably uh, very much the case. I'm also um, not saying that, <coughs> you know, taking medicine um, is the wrong thing to do. And 
I'm also open to the fact that if you take medicine that is covering up symptoms, that may be the opposite of what some other modalities that dive into the um, traumas uh, would be doing. So taking the medicine may actually block you coming in contact with um, these energies. So I, what, I, what I would reiterate is that this teaching here is talking about how if there is an expectation or an um, attachment to things changing how you would like them to change, then that expectation and attachment is going to deliver an extra load on top of the pain that you are experiencing. Um, the teaching also talks about, you know, if you see yourself as the doer, and then there's going to be shame, there's going to be frustration, there's going to be blame towards, um, you know, the medical um, staff that haven't been able to deliver um, things. So we're really talking here about the extra load on top of the pain um, and the pleasure that you experience in the moment. So the other stuff, in a way, how to solve the pain, how to explore the um, deep traumas, is in a way outside of the scope of what we're talking about. Um, not to say it's not relevant for you to explore that, but what I'm pointing out is that this is really about talking about the extra load on top of the 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 pain, which is very relevant to talk about um, because it is an extra load of uncomfortableness on top of the pain and that can intensify the pain in essence. Oh yeah, it's beating me up. I, I, that's why I've been attracted to, you know, the um, Sarah Bob and, and the Master Mia because it, the, the, the mind that I'm in is always blaming me for everything and it's like attacking me that I am not as good as others because I have this, this, and this wrong, and that I'll never, and look at this book that I'm holding, the doctor says that I'm hiding all that, and then when I read so much I hate, then I feel better. But mm. I've had therapy. I've had more therapy than I think I could even handle. I've had 30 years of therapy. That mm -hmm. was my beginning of my life. The spiritual stuff that shows up in us doesn't show up by us. There's no us. Life is doing it. So I just have to be more gentle, and I think by listening to you, it helps me. You know, I wonder though, in your in your process, did you experience any terror or any pain? I mean, or did you just completely wake up easily? Because I've never asked. You know, I've never heard you talk about that. I know that somebody told me you sat on your sofa for two years, and you know, and I and I know you still sit with that, but you still went to see, uh, you know, Ramash. So tell me a little bit, like, what happened with your your. <laughs> <laughs> everyone's every, everyone's got a very unique um you know destiny and uh, even the seeking is going to be very unique um i think from a, a young age when i look back the attitude was um the doership and attachment were relatively weak so um I was very lucky in that regard. I guess um, the seeking wasn't so intense. Um, once I received the information in form of books and teachings from Ramesh, um, it basically sunk in quite quickly um, because there wasn't a lot of the opposite beliefs in the body. Um, so. I am very grateful for the fact that um, the process was quite smooth. Uh, but that being said, um, you know the intensity of someone's ingrained beliefs of doership and attachment to outcomes, which are heavily influenced by the intensity of the life circumstance they had. Um, so. You know, if someone had very intense life circumstance, it makes sense that the hatred, for example, or the shame 
um, could have accumulated and got set in place. Um, but that, that intensity doesn't mean that it's not overcomable, but it's going to happen as it's destined to happen. So the, the teaching really is, even when it gives descriptions, the underlying, um, the underlying theme is one of surrender, right? Surrender to God's will. Um, and the opposite of surrender is I'm going to do this. I'm going to find out. I'm going to ask enough questions to fix this. The teaching is, and I have, I, I really, I, I feel for what you're saying because I know that intense pain is intense. Um, but that you can see how a surrender, um, which is, in a way counterintuitive, but you can see how the surrender isn't actually um, a lack of self-respect. It's not saying, I won't um, get rid of the pain if I could. It's saying, I've tried and it still persists. So let me um, surrender and say, I can't do this. I've been trying. And maybe realize in, in, the, in that surrender, it's recognizing, oh, the teachings have been telling me life is not in my control. Um, so I can... can yeah, that's, that's how Yeah, yes, that is that is right. So, right, thank you. thanks. Thank you. And yeah, keep. I come all the time. I just think what you're doing for all of us during this time is just a gift. So, thank you so much. I could actually cry right now. <laughs> but I'll stop. <laughs> thank you, Sha. And keep the journaling and the exercise up to the extent that they deliver a relief. Um, just don't be ex attached to the outcome. So, Whenever you feel like it, do it. And if it delivers relief, then be grateful. And if it doesn't deliver relief on a particular day, understand it was your destiny to do the exercise and for the relief not to come. But if if it does deliver relief regularly, then you know be grateful for that and no reason to stop. Hmm. Okay. Hi, Barbara. How are you going? Are you there, Barbara? Hello, Roger. Yes, I'm here. I don't know whether I can start the video. Uh-huh. Yeah, I can start the video. The voice, voice, at least voice is mo m most important. I can hear you, so that's good. Oh, good. Okay. So, what's happening? What's or what's been going on? Right. Okay. Uh, can you hear me now? There's a little bit of a delay for that time. 
Right. Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, no, I'm all I'm I'm always doing what I feel like doing. <laughs> so Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's that choiceless choice, isn't it, really? Yeah, yeah. so my question is, I'll try and keep it short you know, so the people but my question is that you know, if life is just spontaneously arising, as you say, in this singular momentary experience and that it I can't come back to anything and that is the truth. From my own direct experience, that is how things are happening. Then, how can, as Ramesh says, how can the movie be in the can if um, you know if there's no future? Is it just that the mind, you know, inverted commas, the mind hasn't caught up? Or could you explain a little bit about that? Yeah. So he, what um, that um, concept is saying is, and it's it's also. A concept in um, in science and physics, and uh, many of us will know that um, what mystics have been saying for thousands of years is actually not far off what um, physicists are um, confirming for themselves based on mathematics. And the mystics um, sort of understood it more directly, I guess, um, from the fact that they had access to a. a a different perspective on life that revealed a lot of things that the you know the physicists find out through um, through mathematics and calculations and uh, observations with with machinery etc. Um, so there's this um, block block theory in in physics um, in quantum physics that basically says all of time happened in an instant and is so there really isn't a past, a present, and a future. It all exists as a block, um, and it's not really linear. Um, but for understanding's sake, you can sort of look at it as linear in a way. But essentially, it's saying that the whole of the universe, from the beginning of time to the end of time, arose spontaneously as a whole. And we are observing that block moment by moment by moment so essentially the um the window that we have is the present moment and the present moment is essentially seeing the block moment by moment by moment so um the the concept says that all of time has happened. All of your thoughts, all of your actions, all of your um, outcomes, your birth, your death, and the birth and death of everyone that has ever lived in the universe and ever will has already happened. And we get to see that, which has already happened, moment by moment by moment, which is what we know in practical terms as our life experience. Um yeah. So that that's, that's such a, such a relief. <laughs> yeah. So that that's how we can reconcile the two notions: is we get a window into the block, which is to see the block um, unfolding. Essentially, the story that came into existence in a moment um, is unfolding through this window that we have access to, and we only get to see one moment. So each moment that we know is essentially the collapse of the previous moment and the emergence yeah. of the next moment, all of which um, exists simultaneously. Yeah, oh, that's such a fan. I'm so, I'm so glad you've said that exactly as you've said it because that was my feeling and my instinct. And to know that is exactly as you've said it. It's just it's so freeing. It's so totally freeing. Um, for the little human, for want of a better word, really, you know, for this, for this, just, um, yeah, and, and almost like resistance is futile, isn't it? Resistance to life as it's happening 
talking about now is because I understand the meaning of resistance is futile, futile. now. It's just, what's the point? That's right. It's uh, saying no when it's all yes. Yeah, it, the point is it's the suffering, I guess. Um, so the resistance is also... The resistance is also in the can, um, as part yeah. of part of the story of life, right? It's not that your resistance is outside of what's in the can. Um, the resistance is also part of the block, and um, if there is awareness of the resistance, that awareness of the resistance is also part of the block, um, and to the extent that we realize. Oh, it's all destiny unfolding, the predetermined story of life unfolding. Then um, that understanding is in the in the block also, um, and because it's in the block, which means we didn't create it. It makes sense that the subsequent um, story that's in the block is one that probably will have less suffering in it because. The story is a story of time and the story of evolution and the story of cause and effect. So if the story has inserted the realization, resistance is futile, it's all in the can, then that has happened not because you as a separate individual um, created that insight, but rather because it was destined for it to be there. Now, if it's destined for that to be there, it makes sense that the story is going to follow on from that, which means destined for less suffering to be there. Yes, I, I already feel that anyway. It's just catching it. And See, when I use the word I, we have to be careful. I hope there's no non-dual police out there. But, you know, when I use the word I, it, it, it's quite sticky now because I, I realise that, you know, that in a way there is no I. It is destiny life unfolding. You could say, you know... There's no I, although there's a sense of I. It's so hard to say. Yeah, but... Um, it's just life unfolding. Yeah, but what's included in that block is a person, right? As in, not separate from the block, but there's no doubt that the the expression um, is there. The, the, the body object is there. The words are there. The thoughts are there. The sense of um, presence is there. And so, really, when we're told there's no I, what it's really trying to point us at, um, when those teachings, is there is no separate I, which is the I we tend to know ourselves as um, to start with. Well, not know ourselves as, but think, think ourselves as. Um, so, when, whenever we say I this and I that, that I is really... Um, has attached to it a definition which is the definition based on our experience and what we assume ourselves to be, which is this separate independent entity that chooses to do this and that and is in control. And, um, and so the teachings are saying there is no I, which is really saying there is no doer, there is no separate self um, yeah. that you believe there to be. And then there, there can be an awakening to the fact that, wow, of course, this is an experience or the block unfolding. And so the, the person is, is not at all autonomous or independent. It's, it's been pre-created, you could say, or um, you know, part of the experience. And therefore, this sense of m me as um, separate and a doer crumbles and collapses um, and then we have this sort of notion oh there you know there isn't an I um, because I was mistaken and now I've seen the light in a sense and and then um, the seeker at that point is um, compelled to go round because it's in the block for all of that to happen have happened that way saying there is no I, there is no I, overlooking the fact that in practice, even though it is all part of a creation, the creation includes, um, it, it includes a person, a person not separate from life, but still 
um, distinct from the tree and the other person within the within the story. So at some point we have to say, oh well, actually on some level, in experience, in practical terms, you know, there is a person that gets in a bed and out of a bed and goes and opens the fridge, um, and often when the when the intellect is stuck on oh there isn't an i it's mistaking the nuance of there isn't a doer that is separate from life and not registering that in practice in practical terms in experience there very much is um the sense of a person and so that's where the integration says oh there is a person in the story of life. It's not separate from life and it's not the doer. But if someone yeah. said, who are you? Then I say, I'm Roger. And what are you? I say, I'm a, I'm a human being. Um, but I know I'm not the doer. I know I'm not separate from life. I know that whatever happens in life is destined and is life unfolding exactly as um, or the only way it can. So that's where we can have an integrated understanding of myself as a person with the deep clarity that the person is not the doer. Um, and then we have the best of both worlds. Yeah, I think that's why I like the word human being in a way because it describes almost like the relative and the absolute, doesn't it? We're human, but we're also being. <laughs> that's perfect. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, and yeah, so when I use... Yeah, no. When I use the word person, I'm really talking about the human being. Um, and yeah. in some other teachings, when they talk about person, what they're talking about is the, the, the way we know ourselves before any integration, which is person before any awakening or integration basically is the psychological identity. And so why they say there is no person is because they're really trying to hammer home to the identity that only knows itself as the identity, which is what you, at that point, you would call the person. So the teaching is saying, you know, the person that you know yourself as is an illusion. It doesn't exist. Um, and that can then create this dissolution that we were just talking about, where, ironically, what's left, the human being goes around saying, there is no person. Because that's really the human being that has seen there is no doer and no um, separate person from the rest of life, um, i.e. seeing that the person is being lived um, or the, you know, the character is being lived. But because the collapse that had happened was in their mind, the collapse of the person, whereas actually it's the collapse of the belief in personal doership. Um, it takes a while to finally crack through that um, sort of uh, perception and, and get someone to acknowledge, well, there is a person. Um, and, and that's why at, those, th at that stage, what someone feels comfortable saying is, oh, no, it's just an apparent person. Um, because it's it's been seen that everything is just appearance um, and it's not as it seems. Um, but there's, a, you know, there's this really important um, insight and realization at some point, which is actually I have to live, I'm meant to live. Enlightened living is living as the person in a world of time and space and form, which is what, actually presents you know if we knock on something it's it's got form and it's solid and and there's this realization oh i have to live as the person in this world of form until the body dies and then we realize that the, all this um chatter about and insisting that there is no person and I, it's not real and it's an illusion is actually a form of preventing us from coming back and forgetting all that in a sense and just allowing the body mind organism to live and if the um if the teachings have really uprooted everything we'll find there's no problem with living 
in a world of form as a separate person, as long as the um, belief in doership and attachment to outcome have fallen away, because we then get to live as this person and in practical terms as a separate as a separate doer in experience and yet all of the suffering that used to happen just doesn't arise and so then it's like oh no problem no problem being a person yes that's that's so beautiful and i suppose really it comes down to again that understanding it is more of an understanding a deep understanding you can live fully as this because for years you know i've been into non-duality for years and, mm-hmm. you know, you must be, you're the absolute, you're the absolute, you know, you're just formless awareness and everything. It's so hard, it's impossible. You know, the mind just can't grasp that. And I was coming from that point of view for so many years. And then when I found Ramesh and you, it was like, yes. finally, I can be myself with the understanding. And this might sound intellectual. I have no idea. I really don't know. But I, there is an understanding there. And just getting clarification of you just makes me want to cry, really. Hmm. Um, would you say that, just quickly, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but would you say that the thinking mind is the doer? It thinks it's the doer. Is that how you would define the doer? Yes. The thinking mind? Yes, they're the same thing. Yeah. They're the same thing, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. And so the working mind, the practical mind, is yes to life. And, you know, um, even though we don't take action, but the action arising in that moment, exactly as it's going to. Yeah, and the working mind um, doesn't have an, uh, isn't in opposition to that. It um, it doesn't... Um, that's where you're saying as well, the creativity comes from that in a way, because there's no block. That's, that's right, yeah. So. Okay. Hmm. Thank you. Much. And there's there's an under the understanding is there when the suffering starts diminishing, and when the suffering no longer arises, which is a, a gradual um, thing that and there's different phases. So uh, the witnessing of suffering is a very important shift, um, and eventually there's no suffering to witness, um, and when that happens, then you know the understanding is total. So, to the extent that the suffering is being interfered with, you know the understanding is deepening, and um, so you shouldn't have any doubts. You, you've just thought, oh, sorry about this, there's just one more thing that's just come up because of this now, and it's, can I ask you personally, Roger, um, obviously, you know, we have preferences. Mm-hmm. Um, what's the difference between a preference and a desire and an yeah. expectation to outcome? Right, okay. Um, so... It's a, it's a little um, tricky because um, Ramesh used to... So in, um, in the teachings of Buddha, it, it says um, enlightenment is the end of suffering. Uh, the cause of suffering is desire and the cause of desire is attachment. Um, so if... If we look at that, what does it mean? Um, so, enlightenment is the end of suffering. Suffering is a result of um, desire, and desire a result of attachment. Now, attachment means basically attachment to outcomes because there is the psychological entity that believes that it will one day be complete when there are certain pleasures delivered. So, if that psychological identity... Um, believes it li- its life depends on outcomes, its life depends on pleasure, it is going to crave um, those pleasures. It's go- and that craving is going to be a craving that comes from the, the core of that psychological um, belief. So it can feel like it is essential, like I need this to live. Um, and so that's what desire is um, referring to, a craving, a craving for a pleasure that we believe we're attached to, which really means a pleasure that we believe will complete us. So um, relationship or money or um, 
uh, well, wh whatever you get, relationship and uh, rela rela love, sex, and money are probably the most intense um, things that humans are attached to. Um, and th that desire means suffering because we will um, suffer when we don't get what we are, des are desiring. We'll suffer when we do get what we're desiring because it's not really what is going to complete us. We will blame the other when the other gets in the way of us getting what we desire. We will blame ourselves when we get in the way of um, getting what we desire and we'll blame life and be worried that life won't deliver what um, what I need or what I feel I need in my desire. Um, so hopefully that's clear because that, that's very much in line with attachment to outcomes in this teaching and doership. However, Ramesh, if someone said to Ramesh, Ramesh, um, enlightenment is the end of desire um, or the cause, of in, uh, the cause of suffering is desire and therefore enlightenment, which is the end of suffering, must be the end of desire. And because Ramesh was very practical and wanted things to be clear, he would say, don't be ridiculous. Desire is perfectly natural. It's part of your biological movement because you have biological preferences. Um, so this is going, this is answering your question, but we have to understand that when Ramesh was saying that, he was using the word desire in a different context to the way that it's used in Buddhism. Um, and it just means he's got a different definition. He would agree that craving after pleasure, thinking that that is what will complete you, is um, is part of the the doer. And so if you if you rephrased it that way, he'd say, yes, of course, I completely agree. Enlightenment is the end of the doer that um, is attached to outcomes. Um, but in, in using the word desire, he was saying, you know, if you've got a... Um, if biological hunger arises in the body and you're hungry, then you are going to desire food, right? Which is now talking about it in the sense of you have preferences. And so he would say that the body is always going to move towards its biological preferences and away from its um, the things that it doesn't like um, biologically. Uh, so he, what he was doing is creating... A distinction that um, doesn't allow a seeker to think that the preference for something is actually the suffering or the cause of suffering. He's saying that as a biological entity with biological preferences, you're always going to have a preference. The issue is when you are attached to your preference being delivered which means when you insist that your preference is what you get because that is what's going to create the um the resistance so he um would say you know if if your preference is available by all means have it um but understand it often won't be available and so um see that as as life and if the psychological identity isn't there then there won't be any psychological resistance to the fact it isn't available um, and also understand that at some point the pleasure you are enjoying is going to um, leave you so um, basically he's um, pointing at your attachment to outcomes being the issue and that we all will have biological preferences. Like some people prefer to be in hot weather or warm weather and other people, you know, can't stand warm weather. And um, that's part of your biological preference. Thank you, Roger. That is, that's very, very clear. And just, just quickly, you say, um, you know, um, being complete doesn't depend on uh, all of that. So being complete is literally just being here and now. Is that it? Yes, the yeah the um, the suffering is actually a sense of inag 
inadequacy, a sense of not being complete, a sense of needing things in the future. So um, the not feeling complete is the suffering. And once again, like um, so many things in, in these descriptions, the completeness is actually just the absence of the sense of not being complete. So when you are just here now feeling at peace, you don't actually have the thought or the feeling that says, I am complete. You just don't have any sense that I'm not complete. You don't have any sense that I need something more. And so that is essentially what I mean by um, we are complete in this moment. And the understanding is that we're complete even if we're not at peace. You, don't, you know, it's, it's not being at peace as well that you are still complete. Yeah, it's just if you're not at peace, um, you're still complete. It's just that um, the psychological identity is saying, I'm not, and covering up, yeah. covering up a connection to your completeness. Thank you. So for me, it's about just saying yes. Instead of no all the time, you know, having, letting go of that resistance to life itself right now. And like you say, you know, not putting yourself in danger or not moving away, it's just an acceptance of this and then doing what I can in the moment. In the, yeah, I completely agree. And if in, to add to that, if you can, sometimes we have to, a yes to saying no um, yeah. with, is, is a sort of d deepening this understanding of saying of yes. It's a, a yes even when we say no, not, not necessarily no to no on a, a resistance level of a no. But if we find ourselves saying, no, I don't think I'm going to come to the party, it's a yes to saying no um, because we're saying no from a place where we f um, see that that is just happening and so we're not in resistance with saying no, um, which really means yes. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, exactly. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Pleasure. See you, Barbara. Bye. Bye-bye. So, um, I think, we're well, we're over time today, so um, we'll stop it there. Uh, I hope uh, to see you, well, to see you again soon.